All right, hey guys, how's it going? Um, so I just had somebody ask me in one of my last videos if I could do a video on uh, all the different instruments, the flight instruments in the helicopter. And so I've got Ruben out today uh, doing some instrument flying, so I figured this would be a perfect opportunity to show you guys the instruments here. So I'm just going to bring it around, um, show you guys the instrument panel, and I'll talk you through uh, what he's doing and what all the instruments do here. So currently, um, I have him set up on a altitude of 1,000 feet. Um, I told him to hold a heading of 340 degrees and 100 knots, so right there. Um, so he's working on that right now. And I want you to turn, Ruben, I want you to turn to a heading of 300 degrees. 300? 300, yep. And let's maintain 1,000 feet and our 100 knots for now, okay? So I'll just go through the instruments from left to right and then uh, kind of show you guys what each one does. A little bit windy out here, so sorry if it's a little bit bumpy on the camera, but I'll um, show you guys what each one is doing here. So uh, this one here is called the Vertical Speed Indicator, or we know it as the VSI. And so what that one is showing us is uh, our climb and descent rate, how fast we're climbing or descending. So uh, you can see right here, it's uh, zero, then five, ten. So that's how many hundreds of feet per minute that you're climbing or descending, or if you're going totally level. So right now it looks like uh, he's climbing at about 200 feet per minute, and so he's constantly working on his altitude control to maintain that 1,000 feet. So um, as the wind gusts us around a bit and stuff, um, he's getting bumped up and down, and when, especially when you're flying about 100 knots, it's easy to climb and uh, descend a little bit of altitude there. So he's working on uh, trying to keep that as close as he can to 1,000 feet. Now, when you're flying on instruments, uh, we talked the other day about the collective and cyclic controls. So the collective control is the one controlling our altitude. So if we want to change altitude down here, uh, we're going to use the collective up and down to adjust that. And then we're using the cyclic, the fore and aft of the cyclic, to adjust our airspeed over here. Okay. So the second one beside it there is the attitude indicator. And that one essentially, um, it's also called the artificial horizon. It's basically like looking outside. So the blue up top is supposed to be the sky, the brown underneath is supposed to be the ground. And so that's showing what the, uh, the artificial horizon is doing. So uh, you can see there's marks on it for banking left and right, um, 10, 20, or 30 degrees, and then the 45 and the 60, and then uh, the up and down as well, so for 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 degree um, nose up or nose down. So that's those ones there. Uh, then next to it right here, we have the airspeed indicator. And so this one is showing in knots indicated right now, and uh, so it looks like we're doing about 95 knots indicated at the moment. So that's looking good. We'll speed up just a tiny bit. And the one uh, next to it over there with the E and the R is the engine and the rotor RPM. And so that one is just simply showing you what percent your engine and your rotor is running at right now. <coughs> We're running at 100% on both of those. So, All right. Then down here, this is our altimeter. So this one is showing the altitude. And so you can see we're at 1,100 feet right now. And Ruben, why don't we climb to 1,500 feet? Uh, we're just getting a little close to the ground here. So I'd like to climb up to 1,500 feet. So he's going to use collective to control that. And then he's still going to use the cyclic to control the airspeed. Now, um, <coughs> it'd be pretty hard to hold 100 knots while climbing. So he's going to slow it down just a little bit to about 90 or so for the climb. Once he gets to uh, 1,500, he'll start leveling that back out again and gain back to 100 knots. Okay. So. Um, the, it's just like a clock, basically, the way this works. So the, uh, the shorthand there, that's your thousands of feet. And then the long hand here is your hundreds of feet. And so right now you can see um, he's showing 1,500 feet. So there's uh, 1,500 feet, and that's what he wants to be leveling out on. <coughs> the one right next to it, uh, right here, that's the heading indicator. So it's a gyroscopic instrument, and uh, it's kind of the same thing as your compass right here. Um, except the compass is got magnets in it and it's north seeking to uh, to the North Pole. Um, but this guy here is just a gyroscopic instrument. We can set it to uh, whatever heading we want. So we always set it according to our compass when we're flying straight and level. And the one uh, right next to it over there, that's the manifold pressure. And so that's just how much pressure is in the manifolds of the engine right now. And that's our power basically. So when we raise and lower the collective, that's adjusting the manifold pressure. Um, that goes up and down accordingly, but, uh, depending on how much torque or how much power we're using in that engine. All right, so Ruben, why don't we do a left-hand turn 
to a heading of 210 degrees. Traffic is all clear to the left. And so we're going to do a nice gentle bank. You guys can see on the artificial horizon here, the attitude indicator, he's banking in at about 20 degrees right now. And uh, we can go a little bit more shallow on that turn. Let's do it more like a 10 degree bank. Everything on instruments should be done nice and slow, nice and gentle. So a nice 10 degree bank there would be good. And we'll turn all the way to 210 degrees. Sounds good. Uh, down here, we don't have anything too interesting for flight. Uh, the main thing to look at is uh, temperatures and pressures and our fuel gauges there. So you guys can have a quick look over that. We've got um, oil pressure, oil temperature, uh, cylinder head temperature, and then our fuel um, gauges there as well. And uh, we have an app meter showing if we're um, drawing a charge or if we're actually charging the battery. Uh, the rest of it is, you know, we've got a clock, we've got some light switches, um, clutch and magneto switches, nothing too serious there. And then down here, uh, we have the top one right there is our audio panel. So that's uh, being controlling our, our different radios as well as the volume and everything. Uh, right underneath it there uh, is our radio. So you can see 122.7 on the left is our correction. Uh, 122.72 is the frequency that we're on right now. And then the, underneath that is the GPS. Underneath that is the transponder. So uh, the transponder is showing the, uh, the tower when we're in a control zone, um, the position of where we're at. So it has a code there for us and everything. All right, so how are we doing here? We're uh, holding basically at 1,500 feet, a heading of 210 degrees. When I say 210, uh, it's 210 degrees on the heading indicator, it just says 21. <coughs> so it just abbreviates it, so 210 degrees. And we're holding pretty much our 100 knots here. We can speed up just a tiny bit more. So. Um, on instruments, it's definitely a, a workload, um, a heavy workload. We're constantly making adjustments, little fine adjustments to all our controls, using the cyclic again to adjust that airspeed, collective to adjust the uh, altitude, and then left and right on the cyclic to adjust our heading. So those are the three main instruments that we're looking at uh, to be able to maintain something constant. So Rim is doing a really good job of that now, especially on a bit of a windy day. I uh, definitely get buffeted around a bit. Sorry if the camera was a bit shaky on that, but uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, just wanted to give a little more information about one of the comments that I had. Uh, one of the people asked um, in my comments, my last one of my last videos, uh, what happens if the tail rotor fails on a helicopter when you're in flight? So I just wanted to take a few minutes. Uh, it's not going to take very long, uh, but just a couple minutes to explain what would actually happen. So um, we talked a couple videos ago about uh, what happens if you don't have your tail rotor. And so we talked about there being torque when the blades are spinning around in a circle to the left like this in a North American helicopter. The torque causes the helicopter to want to spin to the right. Okay, so um, if you lost your tail rotor suddenly, that's what would happen. The helicopter would actually torque to the right. Now, when you're in forward flight, um, you have what's called keel effect. And so that's basically when the wind is blowing over the airframe, um, it blows over the fins on the back. There's a vertical and horizontal stabilizer usually. Um, just the, the shape of the airframe as well. Um, as the wind over, uh, flies over the, the airframe, um, that keel effect keeps the helicopter flying pretty much straight. So without a tail rotor, you're going to notice it as soon as that tail rotor fails in forward flight, you're going to notice it by having a right yaw. So there's going to be probably some vibration, probably going to feel it in your tail rotor or in your pedals, I should say. Um, you'll probably hear a loud noise or something like that if that tail rotor, uh, either you maybe put a, get a bird through the tail rotor itself or your gearbox fails or something, your tail rotor gearbox fails, um, or even the shaft fails to the tail rotor. If any of those things were to happen, which by the way are very, very rare things. Um, it's very rare that you actually would get a failure like this. But if any of those things happen, first thing you're gonna notice is that yaw to the right. So you're gonna know in a North American helicopter that that's a tail rotor failure. So um, first thing to do is to keep your speed up. So you're gonna probably wanna keep, depending on the aircraft, um, usually at least 70 knots or more if you can. And, uh, and that keel effect is gonna keep the helicopter flying pretty much straight. It might be a little bit off to the right like this, but it should keep it mostly straight. So um, the first thing you do is keep your speed up. Second thing you're going to want to do is enter auto rotation. Okay, so we've talked about auto rotation in the past. So collective is going to go down. Um, that's going to enter the auto rotation. Uh, throttle is going to go off. And then at this point, you're actually going to shut your engine off. 
okay? If you shut your engine off and it's not driving the rotor blades anymore, now you're getting rid of the torque. The blades are going to continue spinning just through the airflow that's, uh, that's rushing up through the rotor system, um, but you're not going to have that torque because the engine's not going to be driving those rotor blades anymore. So on the way down, you're going to be descending now, collective's going to be down, you're descending at about 2,000 feet per minute, you're flying, uh, let's say we're flying a Robinson 44 in this example, uh, we're going to be flying probably around 70 knots, maybe 80 knots or something like that. So we're going to keep that forward speed going. Uh, we're going to get rid of the engine. Once we get rid of the engine, we get rid of the torque. So um, we're going to basically finish that, uh, that flight off in auto rotation, basically. So we're going to come down. We're going to keep our speed up. Um, probably we can slow it down at this point now to about 65 knots or so. Uh, which is about the optimal speed for the flare and the auto rotation for the uh, for the R44. We bring the helicopter in. Uh, we don't have any pedal control at this point now. It's just keel effect. So we're going to flare the helicopter. That's all cyclic motion. Uh, we're going to come out of that flare and we are going to cushion the helicopter with the collective. Now, if there's any rotation at all, which there might be a slight bit of rotation, just due to the, uh, the, the friction on like the, it's not even a torque, but it's just a little bit of drag friction on the main rotor gearbox. So if there is a little bit, it'll probably be a slight pull to the left. And um, so if that's the case, it's not a problem. We'll, we'll level the helicopter out, we'll cushion the landing with the collective, and we'll use the cyclic to kind of steer the helicopter in whichever direction it turns. It won't turn very much, um, but let's say it did have a slight turn to the left, you use a little bit of left cyclic, so when the aircraft did contact the ground, you'd actually turn it slightly in that direction, and therefore you're not going to catch a skid, or in this case wheels, um, and roll the aircraft over. So you're just going to slightly turn it in that direction, and that's it. That's really all there is um, if you have a tail rotor failure. Now obviously, um, that's in forward flight. If you have a tail rotor failure in hover, or in slow flight, basically you need to get rid of that torque again. So let's say we're in the hover, all of a sudden, bam, we, we hear maybe we hit our tail rotor on a rock or something like that, we hear a big, big bang and the, the nose starts to spin immediately to the right. It'll actually happen quite violently, it'll be a fast spin to the right. Uh, we just chop our throttle off, get rid of our throttle immediately, um, that gets rid of any engine torque. And then we cushion the helicopter like we would in an engine failure in the hover practice. We just cushion the helicopter gently onto the ground and we can get rid of all that spin um, by getting rid of the torque. So uh, we practice that procedure quite often as well. Uh, we don't practice the tail rotor failures in flight because there's no good way to demonstrate that. We, don't, we can't theoretically fail the tail rotor and we're not going to be shutting the engine off in flight. Um, purposefully, so actually shutting it down. So we don't practice that one. That one's just uh, talked about in our ground school classes. So um, I hope that makes sense. I hope you guys understand that. Um, as always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. Share with your friends. Um, and I will give more videos like this soon. The weather's been kind of gross lately. That's why we haven't been um, doing that much crazy fun flying uh, out in the mountains or anything. But um, hopefully the weather will start clearing up soon. I've got a couple of really cool collaborations planned with uh, a couple different people, uh, which I'll be announcing soon. I'm just waiting for good weather at this point to be able to do those. So I'm uh, looking forward to doing that, and we'll talk to you guys soon.